This is Mark Tobias uh, with Ross Anderson at the University of Cambridge and your responsibilities here are your professor of security. Professor of security engineering. And you've written one of the textbooks in the world on this subject. Mm -hmm. And so I'd like to talk to you today about chip and pin, which is mm -hmm. coming to America, uh, has been in Europe for quite a while. What's your understanding of the difference in implementation and does it matter to the consumer between the United States and how they've done it in Europe and the rest of the world? In Europe and much of the rest of the world, um, consumers have been moved from using a magnetic strip card with a signature to using a chip card with a PIN. And this has been accompanied by a liability shift. What happened in Britain, for example, and also in Canada, was that the banks changed their terms and conditions such that if a merchant uh, had a disputed transaction and that transaction had been done with a signature, the merchant would be liable, whereas if it had been done with a PIN, the merchant would not be liable. So this um, basically moved the merchants to go and change all their terminals to um, PIN terminals. The problem was that if a transaction was disputed with a PIN, then the bank would turn around and say to the customer, sorry, our system is secure, so it must be your fault. Now, there are all sorts of ways in which chip and pin transactions can still be subject to fraud, and in many cases the liability ends up being dumped on the cardholder. Now, in America, the Federal Reserve has refused to agree to this kind of liability shift, and so my understanding is that many banks, when they de de deploy EMV cards, chip cards, they'll be deployed as chip and signature cards. So you'll get a card that's harder to forge, but you will still sign for goods, at least in many stores. So then how do you use the wireless point-of-sale terminals that are so prevalent in Europe? How do you implement that in the U.S.? They still have to print the copy and have you sign it? What happens with the um, contactless point-of-sale terminals is that these are typically used for small transactions. In the U.K. the limit is £15, and you don't use a PIN at all. So all you do is you take your card, or you take your wallet with a card in it and you just tap it against the payment terminal in um, the local sandwich right. bar or whatever and it takes your £4.95. So, but let's say I have a $100 dinner bill. If you've got a $100 dinner bill, then in Europe you can't do that by means of a contactless payment. What you can do with contactless is get your, um, your card details across to the terminal um, in America, my understanding is they'll then ask you to sign for the, um, uh, for the dinner. Um, in Europe, what typically happens is they make a chip and pin transaction where you enter a pin directly into a device carried by the waiter. So, Ross, I take my American Express chip card from America and I come to England. Mm -hmm. The pin that they assign me for that card, then I'm assuming it does turn into a real chip and pin. If you've got a pin on the card, then it would be used as a real chip and pin um, card in Europe. Um, that's assuming that you're using the pin. If you use the pin, for example, in, in ATMs, then that would be a live pin and that would be used for transactions in Europe. So, the, is the whole world essentially going to be universal in chip and pin when this is all done? I mean, America's the la North America is the last holdout. Well, Canada has gone to chip and pin along the same lines as Europe because their regulators allowed the banks to change the terms and conditions in all the merchants. Um, the USA has, is an interesting holdout because America's got a, uh, the USA has got a long tradition of good consumer protection in banking, which has actually stood America in good stead because it's what facilitated electronic commerce. If you go and use your credit card online and somehow it gets stolen online and you've got things on your bill that you don't recognize, you phone the bank and tell them to take them off. It's the bank's problem, not yours. This is great, because it meant that electronic commerce could roll out in America without people getting too anxious about fraud. So, as a consumer, I mean, I was issued a chip and pin card a couple of years ago by diners out of Canada, which makes it a lot easier to pay for things in Europe. Mm -hmm. So, to the American consumer who's reading this, what do they care one way or the other, or do they? Well, if you don't travel abroad much, then you probably don't care very much one way or another. Um, 
what could be interesting is if we start seeing competition in America between different um, card service and payment service providers like we now have in Europe. So in Europe, for example, um, you may be charged extra to use a credit card or get a discount to use a debit card. And this is beginning to bring competition into the payment card industry. That could change quite a lot. And competition in the payment card industry isn't just about cards, it's about phones as well. Um, for example, Google has lo launched a mobile phone wallet in America, and by way of full disclosure I um, helped work on that. Whereas in the UK you have got apps from various banks which enable you to make mobile phone payments out of your bank account directly into somebody else's bank account. And by enabling payments to run on what are in effect direct debit rails, this means that the cost of the payments becomes lower, which means in turn that you may get discounts. So this becomes somewhat like an ACH transaction. Exactly so. For example, um, Barclays is a pioneer in Britain with what, an app that they call Pingit, and um, you use this to send money from your mobile phone to another mobile phone number. And Barclays have got a list of everybody in the UK and their mobile phone numbers, so they can link up to the bank accounts of the payee. These are postpaid numbers, not prepaid. Um, these can also be prepaid numbers if you're using the same prepaid number and the bank has found out who you are uh, and you've filled on the appropriate web forms then yes indeed you can send money from and receive money at prepaid mobile phone numbers. And if I get money into my phone then can I transfer that to my bank account so I can turn that into actual money? That's the idea. If you receive money at a mobile phone that hasn't been used in such a system before they basically send you an SMS saying, go to our website here and click here, fill in your bank account details, and we'll send you the money that you've got. Oh, clever. So, obviously there's a security difference between MagStripe, which is 50-year-old technology, and chips. How difficult are the chip cards to break? There's an awful lot of um, hype about this, but in fact when chip cards were introduced in the UK, fraud actually went up, right? Because uh, the banks were reissuing millions of cards to people and there were thefts from the post. Also the crooks started using mail order and telephone order transactions. And also once all merchants were asking for people's pins at the point of sale, it became easy for bad guys to use false terminals to collect card and pin data. Eventually these were kind of sorted out, but the level of fraud is still roughly where it used to be. And there are some interesting new tricks that have come out. So there was a huge breach of security as you're aware at Target stores. Like 40 million credit and debit cards. And I believe they hacked into the system in order to steal all the credit card numbers. Is that kind of problem going to be alleviated with chip cards or it's still the same problem once they have the credit card number in the clear it doesn't matter it's still the same problem as far as transactions made by mail or telephone or the internet are concerned in that the physical card doesn't take any part in the transaction other than a means of reminding you of what your card number is and so changing the card technology doesn't change anything at all now, preventing mail order and telephone order fraud is about intrusion detection systems run by firms like FICO, for example, who screen billions and billions of transactions for the banks and look for anomalous patterns of abuse. So, is the if I want to clone, if I'm a bad guy, like we've had many instances of recently, I want to clone a card or skim a card. Can I do that in the same way from the ch I, information from the chip? I mean, obviously from MagStripe it's easy. Yes. But what about from the chip? It's in theory possible to clone chip cards, um, but the equipment is expensive and the process takes time and money. And so what happens in practice is that a, a bad guy sets up a terminal in a store, or hacks a terminal in a store so you can collect card and pin data, and he then makes a mag stripe card using the data stolen from the chip. Now, all chip cards still have mag stripes as well, so that they can be used in fallback mag stripe mode if the chip isn't working, right, or right. if you're in a country like America that doesn't use chips yet. 
And so the big game in the UK is that you put skimmers on cash machines, you steal information from chip cards, you observe the pins that people enter at the ATM pin pad, and you then send that to accomplices in America who make up mag stripe cards right. and use them in American ATMs. Can you do that, but can you do that same process with chip cards? Can I take my the number imprinted, for example, on the front of my card? Is it the same credit card number that's encoded in the chip, that's encoded on the mag stripe, that's encoded on the front of the card? You need extra information to make a chip card because a chip not only has your account number and expiry date in it, but a digital certificate, which is a, a, basically a, a cryptographic checksum produced using the bank's private key on your account number and your expiry date and other data, and that can be verified by a terminal at which you present it. However, once you have seen somebody's card and read it electronically, then you know what the value of the electronic certificate is, and you can put that in another card, right? which you can then um, use to take money. This is called the yes card attack. Now this only works when the merchant terminal is offline because when it's online there's a cryptographic handshake takes place between the card issuing bank and the chip card to verify that the real live chip card is there. There are attacks on that too but, there are, but they're more complicated. <laughs> so but the, the, the reality is if it's digital at the end of the day it's really not secure. It's more secure than MagStripe, but it's much more complex, and so there are many more things to go wrong. For example, we discovered when a guy came to us and complained of phantom withdrawals from his account in the Canary Islands, um, we found that um, the ATM was generating random numbers for use in the authentication protocol, which weren't random at all. Um, the ATM was essentially using a counter and this meant the random numbers were predictable and this meant that um, somebody who had had temporary access to that chip card could have generated the authentication information to use a clone card letter at an ATM. So there's all sorts of little tricks like this that you occasionally see but it's generally hard to industrialize them and so in general um, chip cards are more secure against direct cloning attacks than max stripe cards were. So do you think the chip cards when they're fully implemented in the United States will actually reduce the cost for bankers for fraudulent losses which theoretically should pass on to the consumer but of course that's theoretical. I don't think it will benefit banks very much in the USA because the Federal Reserve isn't going to allow US banking industry to dump liability on consumers the way has happened in Britain, for example. Do you think this will force all the point-of-sale terminals to go to chips? Well, this is one of the main driving forces for EMV deployment, in that there are companies which stand to make billions of dollars from forcing all the um, stores to upgrade. And there are other companies which hope to make money on the back of that. Uh, for example, people who are promoting mobile payment systems may find that mobile payments work a lot better once all the terminals are modernized. So there will be driving forces that are you know, not directly aligned with either bank profits or customer welfare. So one of my colleagues was just in Hong Kong and put his chip and pin card into an ATM and put in the wrong pin and it said, do you want to change the pin on your card? So he put in any pin he wanted and he got money. Is this a problem? Is this common? Is this a glitch? I, I'd never heard of this and could not believe it, but he said, yeah, yeah I got the money out of the machine. I've um, heard of such problems in the past, and in fact, once when I was in India, I entered the wrong PIN, and um, the terminal said wrong PIN, but the transaction went through anyway, and I got my goods from the store. So, so it's me, not impossible. It's not impossible. And there have been cases, for example, when there have been software faults um, at um, ATM interchanges uh, where people were able to get uh, money out with the wrong pins. And in America, after 9-11, when some of the processing um, capability was compromised by the damage around lower Manhattan, uh, the banks took a view that they would just basically give money from the ATMs right. to anybody provided they had a PIN. In, in that case they were checking PINs but they couldn't check available balances. So a lot of poor people got themselves unauthorized overdrafts 
I'm good chest but that was so. such a such an unusual circumstance that frankly uh, I'd be surprised if the banks hadn't done that well absolutely there are some times when you you just you do, do it you just do it and the, there was one Y2K glitch where one um, ATM exchange in Hungary um, had a Y2K compatibility problem with their software and as a result a number of people were able to take um, money out um, despite not having funds available in a number of countries and so that, that was a precursor to the 9-11 incident. And of course they went and paid all the overdrafts back. Well, I remember there was some litigation going on about which bank should pay which other bank for that particular follow-up. A couple other questions. Where's, where is NFC going? Is it going to be the standard for cell phone payments? Is this going anywhere? Is Bluetooth going to be the standard? Apple still hasn't implemented NFC in their latest phone which obviously is a driving force in the industry. Samsung obviously has on the Android side. Do you have any idea where this is all going to shake out or does anybody know yet? The fundamental problem is that payment systems are a two-sided market. And this means it can take an awful long time for a new payment mechanism to take off. Right, because it's not worth your while getting a card for a new system until enough merchants So there's market animals. penetration. And if you're a merchant, you don't want to go and buy a terminal until right. enough people have cards. And again and again and again, new ideas in the payments industry have stalled because of this two-sided market mm -hmm. phenomenon. It's just like computer software. I mean, once Windows is established, it's very, very hard to change to a different operating right. system because people wrote all the software for, for Windows, right? It's the same phenomenon. And so we saw credit cards being introduced on a small scale in the 1950s and a bigger scale in the 1960s. It wasn't until the mid-1980s that they became a profitable product for banks because it took 20 years for it to build out. Now, I expect that we'll see the same kind of lag and uh, delay and, and difficulty over NFC payments. But what is interesting is that we're starting to see some real competition in the payment market once more. And in my lifetime, that's only happened once before, you know, with the dot-com boom when PayPal came along. Right. And merged out of half a dozen competitors. Apart from that, this is a market that has been rigid. It's been a duopoly of Visa and MasterCard pretty well. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's been immobile. But with new uh, mobile payment apps coming along, and with ACH-based payments, and with new types of, uh, you know, doing payments overseas, um, suddenly things are beginning to get shaken up. Is PayPal going to go into this market? Who knows? It's a matter of what markets as well. You see, one of the biggest tensions in the USA is that many people pay with credit cards for everyday things like, you know, shopping and supermarkets. Yeah, all of us do. And so Walmart, for example, um, sell about $200 billion worth of goods a year on credit cards. And that means that they pay 2.5% Right. of $200 billion, which is $5 billion, to the banks, to, in effect, a cartel of banks. And Walmart are really, really sore about this, and they've litigated against Visa in the past, and they've got together with about 20 other big retailers, and they've made noises, and, hey, you know, the really interesting thing in America would be if Walmart and 20 other big stores... Issued their own card? Issued their own card, or got together with with Google or got together with some new technical payment platform, something like Ping It or something like Zofort, which is an American, which is a, a, a German ACH style payment system, then there's enough money in it for them to mm -hmm. actually do this. And that could really upset the banks, Visa, MasterCard, Apple Card. Do you think the banks would allow it? The banks do everything they can to stop Walmart uh, being in a position to do this. And one of the reasons that the EMV specs, the chip and pin specs in America, are different from in Europe is that the US banks do not want Walmart to be able to easily move all its customers from credit card to pin debit. But you know, Walmart's already made a deal with Amex with their um, debit card for all the folks that shop at Walmart. It's, it's a full banking system. Well, absolutely, and Walmart also offers debit cards to its customers. Yeah, but they use Amex to do it. Um, they, they may have their own debit card as well, but they have a, an agreement with Amex. It's called Bluebird. I hadn't seen that. Yeah, they're at all the, uh, the Walmart stores. 
there's there's minimal charge, like a dollar transactional charge. Everybody can have direct debit, they can have direct payment, and so it would, uh, frankly, the money is there for Walmart and a lot of these, the targets of this world, to do this. And the question is whether the banking lobby would allow them to do it in the United States. Well, that's going to be a very interesting tussle, because in the United States, the banking lobby is slightly less powerful than it is in places like uh, Britain or France or Germany. And the reason is that in America, you've got about 20,000 banks, and here we've got about four. Right? And more concentrated industries tend to be more powerful. Ross, thanks very much. Thank you.